Human Performance and Limitations, Lesson 3. Welcome to Lesson 3. It's going to be a short lesson today. We're going to talk about ozone, cosmic radiation, relative humidity, extreme temperatures, and the nervous system. And after that, we have a few exam questions as usual. All right, we're going to start off with ozone, which is a crucial for shielding us against harmful UV radiation in the stratosphere. It demands attention due to its varying concentration. While it forms thin layers of just a few millimeters thick in certain regions, it can extend up to several kilometers in others. This disparity requires vigilance, especially during altitude changes. In the stratosphere, ozone acts as a shield against the sun ultraviolet rays, vital to our well-being. However, at lower altitudes, particularly in the troposphere, elevated ozone levels can pose health risks. The layer thickness fluctuates with altitude, with concentrations increase as we ascend. So when we climb, the concentration increases. Therefore, awareness of ozone presence and distribution is crucial for pilots, especially during climbs and descents. Certain parts in the world mandate carriers to install ozone monitor devices on board. These devices enable real-time monitoring of ozone levels ensuring prompt action if concentrations reach higher hazardous levels. Additionally, certain aircraft, notably those used for long-haul flights, are equipped with converters designed to mitigate the effect of elevated ozone levels and occupants. These converters heat up the air temperature to over 400 degrees Celsius, effectively breaking down ozone into harmless oxygen. So what happens is, Basically, you have three oxygen atoms, and when they get heated into these converters at above 400 degrees Celsius, they turn into oxygen O2. There's also a very interesting uh, research that I found. I'll also put the link down in the description. Here you can see the differences on a couple of flights. A, B, and D don't have the converters for the ozone and C does, and here you can see the big difference in the amount of ozone which was measured inside the airplane. All right, now we're gonna talk about cosmic radiation. Cosmic radiation comes from sources outside of our solar system and our sun. To make it simple, the higher we climb into the atmosphere, the more severe the effects of radiation on the human body will be. Galactic radiation consists mostly of photons and alpha particles from outside our solar system. They are high energy and predictable in their attentions and interactions with our atmosphere. Solar flares give charged particles from the sun and become significant during solar storms. The energy of these are lower than from the galactic radiation but since they are unpredictable in radiation yield, aircraft may have to descend and fly at a lower altitude during solar storm when there is an increase in the number of solar flares. Important to know, there is little effect below 25,000 feet. Above 49,000 feet, it is mandatory to measure the cosmic radiation and it must be displayed to the flight crew. Long-haul flights have about 5 microsieverts per hour. Short-haul flights about 1 to 3 sieverts per hour. Increase of radiation of any sorts leads to an increase of cancer that can lead to death. It can also damage our nervous system and organ damage of any other organs. A study in the USA on one route between Minneapolis and New York concluded that if a thousand people would work this route for 20 years, six of them would die from radiation, from cancer directly related to the radiation they would have from the job. It is, however, important to know that 220 of the thousand crew members will also die from cancer that is caused from other daily activities. People that live in higher altitudes are also subjected to higher doses of radiation. There are not enough studies to see a difference in cancer-related deaths between living at a lower or higher altitude. Humidity and relative humidity. Humidity is the measurement of water vapor in the air. For humans, 
the ideal comfort is between 40 and 60% humidity. At 100% humidity, the air is saturated. At high levels where we fly, the humidity outside can be less than 1%. To compensate this, the cabin humidity gets to around 15% by using water humidifiers. The reason this isn't higher is because of the weight of the water and the more moist in the air, the more smelly the air becomes, the more corrosive the environment in the airplane becomes, and in all the nooks and crannies, mold can form. Some unpleasant consequences of this dry air, as you might have noticed before on long-haul flights, are dry skin, dry eyes, sore throat, and thirst experience. You can help fight this by drinking water or any other fluid that compensates the moisture in your body, creams or sprays that help your skin, or having different designs of airplanes to get the relative humidity higher, which are only getting higher as long as the door plug stays in. Extreme temperatures. Normally, the body temperature is about 37 degrees Celsius. In extreme hot or cold circumstances, we may perform worse. Imagine if I drop you in a bath of ice and ask you to perform math. You would probably only shiver and get hypothermia. Now imagine yourself in a small boat in full sunlight at very high temperatures without proper airflow. You will feel like you're about to die and most likely get a heat stroke and throw up a couple of times. Whenever there is an extreme, we don't feel comfortable. It distracts us from the normal flying task, or we might even be able to do so. If our heating doesn't work, our body will shiver, thus using more energy and more oxygen. You can see how this leads to many issues. When it's too hot, increase airflow, drink enough moisture, and also replace salt. When we sweat, we lose a lot of salt. Salt that we need to keep the water inside our body. When it's cold, remember the sooner we find out, the more actions we can take. The colder we become, the more impaired we will be. When our body reaches around 25 degrees Celsius, we will just die. If you are wet and cold, get yourself dry. Heat loss is increased when we are wet. All right, great. Welcome to the nervous system. Glad you're still here. In a nervous system, we can look at location and function. So first we're going to talk location wise. The central nervous system is the big brain, the small brain, the brain stem and the spiral cord. The peripheral nervous system is basically all the rest. And they have two kinds of nerves, sensory and motor. Sensory basically is something that gets a sense response and sends it to the brain to get a response back. And the motor nervous basically sends a message back to do the task. Apart from the location, we can also make a separation on function. The sensory somatic nervous system controls the muscle at our skeleton. This is important to remember because we can choose to stand up, walk, raise our arms, but you can decide to increase your heart rate or to just skip a beat. The autonomic nervous system controls our internal organs and glands. We don't need to think about our kidneys. We don't need to remember our heart every second to pump it. It's all done automatically. Movements that we do voluntary are animal. Involuntary movements, like controlling our organs, are vegetative. In this involuntary system, we have two other parts that are a sympathetic and a parasympathetic. The sympathetic system is what gives us fight or flight. It can also give a fast response. Let's say if you put your hand on a burning plate, like a barbecue. It would take long for the normal system to send information to the brain, process it and wait for a response. So it will take action itself. Pull the arm away. The parasynthetic system is more relaxation. It helps the body to function again after stress. It is important to know we as humans adapt. If you hear a noise for a long time, we will zone it out. If we are flying at night, we are more sensitive to light. The way we adapt depends on each person. It can depend on age, our health and many other factors.
Alright, so that was it for the learning part today. I have two exam questions. I'm going to read the question and then afterwards I'm going to get the answer. Which gas or fluid used or transported in aviation is both extremely corrosive and toxic? I'm going to give the answer in five seconds. If you wish to pause, please do so. The correct answer is alpha. The second exam question for today, a high pulse rate will be caused by, I'm going to give the answer in five seconds. If you wish to pass, please do so. The correct answer is the delta. All right. Thank you for watching this lesson three of human performance and limitations. Please subscribe if you want to be updated and give it a like if you enjoyed it. Any feedback is always welcome. And if you have any questions about any subjects, please drop it down below. Um, all of these subjects are pretty much basically covered right now. There's not really much going in depth, but that also has to do with that we are in Europe and English isn't our primary language. Uh, for most of the countries that we have here. So a lot of you guys will also have English as a second, third or even fourth language. So I think it is very important that you understand what we're talking about and then we can add all the fancy wording um, maybe in a separate video if people would like to have it. So, all right, thank you very much and I wish you all a great day and safe flights. Bye.